what are regressive taxes? I believe we read the slides. I believe most of us should have read through the slides. Taxes that take a larger percentage of lower incomes and a smaller percentage of higher incomes. Example, sales tax. Sales tax, this is the tax you are charged whenever you are buying a good or service. All right, we're going to look at it in detail. Sales tax, sales tax and excise taxes. Right, so today we're going to be looking at direct and indirect taxes, and we're also going to look at tax incidence. Tax incidence is all about who the tax burden falls on. Does it fall on the uh, the seller or the producer, or does it fall on the customer? All right, that's tax incidence. So first, we're going to start with direct and indirect taxes. So colleagues, what are direct taxes? Direct tax. Yes. Yes, he, well, they can say direct this is a tax that is directly paid to the government. That's all. For example, income taxes, right? Income tax, the tax which is based on the income that you make, all right? And then what about indirect taxes? I got this chart from P Price Waterhouse Coopers on income tax. All right, these are some rates for the amount of income up to 57,600, 0%, 57,600 to 8,1,600, 20%, 8,1,600 to 106,830%. Over 100,600, it's 7.5%. The chart of income tax. Right, another good example of a direct tax is the land tax. If you own land, the tax which you're paying to the government, even personal property tax. Right, these are examples of direct tax where you're paying it directly to the government. Mm. 
All right, then indirect taxes. Sure, colleagues, at least we must know what an indirect tax is. I believe we read through the, those, those slides. One way you can think of them is these are taxes that are collected by the seller from the customer to give to the government. Or oh, these are taxes that can be imposed on a third party. And the third party is the buyer. All right. Good examples of indirect taxes sales tax let's say this is the tax whenever you purchase any good or pay for any service all right there's a tax involved in that charge all right and you as the buyer are going to be responsible for paying that charge so when you pay that charge the seller and they collect the money they've also collected the tax for the government which they're going to give to the government. Are we okay with that, colleagues? Another type of indirect tax is a value added tax. Colleagues, what is value added tax? At least someone should say something of this one. I'm fine, how are you? Or we can say it's a tax which is imposed on a good at every stage of production for the value added. All right? Every stage the good is passing, it's going to the tax is going to be charged for the value added. So I'm going to illustrate that. All right. Some countries use the sales tax system. Other countries use the value added tax system. Zambia uses the value added tax system. So I just want to illustrate both.
So in both scenarios, we're going to have a tax rate at 10%. So first we look at uh, sales tax, all right? We're going to look at how millet comes from the farmer. The farmer sells it to the miller, let's say at uh, 10 quarter. The miller produces the millet into flour and then sells it to the bakery at 20 quarter. All right. Then the bakery finally is going to sell to us, the customers. Now, with sales tax, this is where the tax is going to be imposed. The farmer, the miller, and the baker, they each have to obtain resale certificates so that they don't have to pay tax. All right. The tax is only going to be applied when it's being sold to the buyer. So, for example, if the, the baker wants to sell the bread at 30 quacha, all right, tax is at 10%. So, 10% of 30 quacha is 3 quacha. So, the baker is going to sell the bread to the buyer at 33 quacha. All right. 30 quacha they are going to keep. The other three quacha will be given to the government. All right. And so I said uh, indirect taxes is where the seller collects the tax for the government. All right. Any questions before we go to value added tax system? Yes, yes. Now well, let's look at the value added system. Right. So here, everybody is going to be taxed. All right. This farmer, when he sells the millet to the miller, all right, he's going to be taxed, all right? So we say the tax is going to be at 10%, all right? So initially you're selling it at 10 quacha. Now there's a 10% there's a 10% tax. So let's find 10% of 10 quacha. That is one quacha. So the miller, I mean the farmer is going to charge the miller 11 quacha. All right, 10 quacha is going to keep. One quacha goes to the government. The miller makes the flour and is going to sell it to the bakery. So it's, there's also going to be a tax again. All right, so in our earlier example, he sold it at 20 quacha. Now there's going to be a 10% tax. So 10% of uh, 20 kwacha, that is 22 kwacha. Then you sell the flour to the baker at 22 kwacha. 20 kwacha, he keeps. 2 kwacha goes to the government. All right, then again, the bakery is going to sell to the buyer. All right, 10% of 30 kwacha, that's 3 kwacha. So he'll sell 33, the bread to the buyer, 33 kwacha. 30 kwacha he keeps. 30 kwacha goes to the government.
Yes. Now with value added, again, there's input and output tax. So input tax, this is the tax just when you're buying the raw materials. All right, so for like for the, the mill, the input tax is this one quarter is paying to the farmer. Then the output tax is when you are selling the good. So for the miller, the output tax is this two quarts. All right. Then to the bakery. Their input tax is this two quarter. The tax you, you pay when you are buying the raw material, input tax is two quarter. Then the output tax, the tax which will be charged when you sell the material, is three quarter. So the way it works is whenever the output tax the output VAT tax is greater than the input VAT tax Right, the difference is what is paid to the Zambia Revenue Authority. All right, so for if we look at the miller here, right, his output tax is greater than the input tax. So you say two minus one, that is one quatch. So that one quatch is the one which the miller is going to pay to the government. Then, if the input tax is greater than the output tax, you get refunded by ZRA, right? You get the difference, or whatever that difference is, you're going to be refunded by ZRA, right? So in this case, also the baker, his uh, output tax was greater than the input tax, so three minus two quacha, that one quacha gives to the Zambia Revenue Authority. Yes, any questions, colleagues? can now look at um, tax incidents. This is where we're seeing who the tax burden falls on. All right, so uh, let me just illustrate first with a graph, all right.
Now, tax incidence is also dependent on uh, elasticity, elasticity of demand and elasticity of supply. So, colleagues, do you remember what price elasticity of demand is? Do. Yes, yes. How quantity demanded responds to changes in price. Right? So here I'm going to give you an example when the demand is unit elastic. All right. When demand is unit elastic. We're going to look at how many scenarios. That would be I think we've got 10 scenarios to look at. First, we'll look at elasticity of demand. Then we'll look at elasticity of supply. All right. So we're going to start with elasticity of demand. When price elasticity of demand is unit elastic. What does unit elastic mean, colleagues? What does unit elastic mean? When the change is, yeah, basically the change is not proportional to, change in quantity demanded is proportional to change in price. So that is when uh, the price elasticity of demand is one. All right, so we have demand which is unit elastic, all right. First, at first, we do not have any tax, all right. Colleagues, do we remember consumer surplus and producer surplus? Uh, price ceilings and price flows can affect consumer and producer surplus. Do you remember consumer surplus? Consumer surplus, this is the benefit to the consumer. Producer surplus, this is the benefit to the producer in layman's terms. Then if we start digging deeper, consumer surplus, the difference between what you are willing to pay and what you actually pay, right? If you are willing to pay 20 kwacha for a shoe and you find that shoe is going for 10 kwacha, all right, your consumer surplus is 10 kwacha. All right, if you find a shoe for 90 kwacha, you want, you are, you are ready to pay for a shoe for 90 kwacha, and you find that shoe is going for 50 kwacha, your consumer surplus is 40 kwacha.
Okay. So when no tax uh, is imposed, so the consumer surplus is here at the that uh, the top. Uh, then producer surplus is the bottom half. Right. So now. In this example, we're going to say, okay, a tax of uh, 10 quart of 6 quacha has been imposed. All right, a tax of 6 quacha has been imposed. Right, our supply curve is going to shift. Right, originally the consumers were paying seven quarter for this good, now a tax of six quarter has been uh, imposed. All right. So now let's say that we're paying ten quarter now, All right? The price of this good has increased to ten quarter. Okay. Now what we're interested in is uh, who is going to bear the most burden with uh, this tax, all right? Who is going to bear the most burden with the tax? So when demand is unit elastic, all right? The tax burden, please write this down, all right? When demand is unit elastic, the tax burden is shared uh, equally between the producer or the seller and the consume. All right. This is going to be illustrated by this small box. Let me shade this small box. This box I'm shading green. All right. This box represents the tax revenue that will be that government is going to get. All right. So as I said, the tax burden it's it's shared equally. So the consumer will pay three quarter out of this six quarter. Consumer will pay three quarter, and uh, the supplier or the producer is also going to pay. A three quarter. All right. So if you can see this distance here, three quarter, and here, this distance here, three quarter. All right. So originally, all right, when this when there was no tax, when this wood was going for seven quarter. All right. Oh, let me add the number of units there too first, so that we can. Calculate this. I believe when we can calculate this, it will make more sense. Yes, yeah, so originally when the when the the this good was going for seven quarts people demanded uh, 1000 units now since there's a tax has been put demand drops to 500 units so we want to find out first first thing we want to find out is how much revenue has been raised through the taxes all right so here we just get to the area of the green box, 
Okay, you just isolate that green box. All right, the height six meters, not six meters, but just six. The length 500. So, colleagues, what's six times 500? So, 3000 is going to the government as tax revenue. Now we'll find out how much of that 3,000 is coming from the, um, the consumers and how much of that 3,000 is coming from the, the, the sellers, all right? So remember, this box has been divided to, to here it is three, three quarter the consumer, three quarter the, the seller. So you're going to say three times 500, for this small box which represents the consumers, three times 500, that's 1,500. So 1,500 comes from the consumers. Then for the producers, this lower box which I'm illustrating here represents what's coming from the producers. The one I'm shading here. So we're going to say three times 500, 1,500. So when demand is unit elastic, the tax burden is shared equal amongst the customer and the seller. And an example of this tax is an excise tax. Colleagues, what is an excise tax? This is a tax imposed on goods that the government wants people to consume less of, all right? For example, cigarettes, alcohol, gambling, all right? Government doesn't, like here in Zambia, government doesn't like gambling, so you find these gambling um, places, they will impose an excise tax, right? If it's Dubai, their government does not like alcohol, so they impose that on um, alcohol. All right. So this tax will be felt both by the produce, the seller, and the buyer. Even the producer will feel this tax also. Whoever is producing tobacco or any ingredients for alcohol, the tax will also be imposed on them. So the main point here, when um, demand is unit elastic, the tax burden falls equally amongst the buyer, I mean the seller and the producer. Now let's look at when demand, let's say it's uh, relatively elastic. Remember, there are six scenarios because we're also going to look at when supply is elastic, inelastic, relatively elastic. So here now I'll look at when demand is relatively elastic.
Okay, so for relative, when demand is uh, relatively elastic, right, what happens is whenever a tax is placed, the burden is going to fall more on the seller than it's going to fall on the buyer. So you can write this down. When demand is relatively elastic, right, the tax burden is going to fall more on the seller than on the buyer. All right. So here you we can see this by this small triangle here will represent the tax paid by the customer 10 minus 8 that is 2 as i said it says still a 6 quarter tax being placed All right so 10 minus 8 that is 2 8 minus 4 that is 4 in total 6 the government is still getting its own 3000 um revenue but in this case um, the burden is going, is going to fall mostly on the sellers and the producers all right this this can also be another excise tax government wants industries that are producing goods they deem as bad to produce less they'll place an excise tax where the burden even falls more on the producer and the sale so that they don't produce as much all right so how much is coming so we know in total the tax revenue is um, three thousand right three thousand how much comes from the customer represented by this green box here you're going to say two times uh, 500 that is uh, 1000 1000 comes from the customer and how much comes from the seller yeah you're going to say four times five hundred two thousand. Right. So when demand is relatively elastic, the tax burden will fall more on the producer. The rule of thumb to remember is the more elastic demand becomes, meaning the more flat this line becomes the more the tax burden is being shifted down to the producer. Okay, because when demand is perfectly elastic, okay, where is that diagram? When demand is perfectly elastic, it falls on, the tax burden is going to fall only on the seller. Okay. okay, this is how the graph should look. Just in case you are told to, to, to draw a graph. You never know these lecturers can be funny at times. When demand is perfectly elastic, like in a perfect competition. Remember the comp perfect competition market structure? In a perfect competition, when government imposes a, a tax, the burden is going to just fall on the sale and the produce. And the tax shifts this curve backwards. So here it is um, 500.
Oh, I haven't drawn the graph properly. But you get the logic, colleagues. Here, here is the tax incidence here. Right? It's for this rectangle here. Uh, the, the burden is going to fall completely on the sale. The consumer won't be affected. Now, the other rule of thumb is the more inelastic demand becomes, the more the burden is going to shift uh, on the consumer. All right? And when we say more inelastic, what does inelastic demand mean, colleagues? What does inelastic demand mean? Your demand curve should be like this. Hmm? This is when you say relatively inelastic. Remember, uh, is it? Yes, third year you are going to meet this again. And you are going to be applying um, implicit differentiation on this. Those will be taking managerial economics. Yes, you'll be you'll be doing implicit differentiation with this. So this is the time to um, this is the time to remember, Mike. What is uh, inelastic demand? Okay, so as you can see here, with this graph, which is uh, demand is um, inelastic, as you can see, this area I'm shading, this is the tax burden that falls on the consumer. All right. Then we can see for the seller, the tax burden is less. Right. The more inelastic demand becomes, the more the tax burden shifts to the consumer. All right. And then if demand is perfectly inelastic, and it's perfectly inelastic, the tax burden falls on solely on the consumer. Sales tax. Okay, sales tax, and this is where you see the burden of the tax being more on the consumer side. Okay. When demand is perfectly inelastic, as you can see, this box here shows um, the tax burden that falls solely on the consumers. Okay. Solely on the consumers. All right, colleagues, I think this is what we can end for today. Can end for today. Yeah. So basically, what I was explaining are these graphs here. Okay, as you can see, 
this is what the lecturer was trying to illustrate to you all right when supply is perfect here in this case now supply is perfectly uh, elastic mm -hmm. it, so next time we meet we'll look at supply okay but for demand just remember the rule of thumb is this the more elastic the demand becomes the more the tax burden falls on the seller the more inelastic demand the demand becomes the tax burden falls more on the buyer inelastic demand this is where quantity demanded does not respond greatly or does not respond that much to changes in price right examples of goods that have demand which is price inelastic is medicine right medicine even though they increase the price of medicine let's say you're suffering from diabetes they increase the price of that medicine you will still need it so you you will still be forced to buy it that's why with inelastic goods hmm, producers of these goods if they want to increase revenue they just need to increase the price because they know that huh, the demand is not going to change because our good is a necessity so it's like they have a control over it okay yes all right colleagues this is where we end we'll meet uh tomorrow cost accounting we'll be looking at variance costing then process costing those uh, uh, Lusaka residents please come physically process costing you need to be physical with me that's a very ish that's that's a confusing topic mm. Mm. you need to be physically with me 